our our keynote speakers are tonight are we have Dr. Um, Goosby Smith from the Citadel and she's going to speak first and then we have Dr. Darren Limville and he is from Clemson and then he's going to speak and then we have an opportunity for questions and answers. So um, I'm going to let them each tell you all about themselves um, and then go ahead and speak and tell us what we need to know and listen and learn. Um, I just find it works better that way. <laughs> so if you'd like to go ahead, Dr. Smith, uh, I'm going to just unmute you if I can and go ahead and, and you have the floor. All right, well, I just started my stopwatch and 10 minutes is my stop time. And so my name is Dr. Jay Gooseby Smith and I serve in several roles at the Citadel. I'm a tenure professor, um, associate professor of management and of leadership. And I serve as assistant provost for diversity, equity and inclusion. And finally, um, I serve as director of our Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Center. And what we do with that center is we have dialogues between people of um, different groups. And so I just wanna take a few minutes to uh, talk with you a little bit about um, the theme for tonight. It's kind of near and dear to me. It was interesting listening to you talk about how um, different generations use social media very differently. And one of the things as a professor of leadership is that when you are a leader, one thing you have to think about is what is going to be your brand of leadership. And one of the things, if you're going to be a successful leader, uh, part of that brand is going to have to do with trust and part of that brand is going to have to do with character because when we think of leadership, leadership is actually a moral profession. You're actually articulating a vision that you can see and you're working with others to try to influence them to help you realize this vision. So leadership is a profession that doesn't exist without other people. It involves followers, it involves allies. And so your role as a leader is to create alignment between your vision and what other people need. And so trust is a key part of that. And so one of the things that um, came to my mind when I heard um, the gentleman mention that the generations use social media differently. Um, I encourage all of you to think about what is your brand going to be? So is your brand going to be the activist? Is your brand going to be the business student? Is your brand going to be the technical um, expert? And think about what you post in terms of what your brand is going to be because whatever you post sits on servers um, infinitely for very long periods of time. And when people Google you, they will find the things that you have put on your public social media and they'll find the things that are the artifacts. So videos that you've done, um, YouTubes that you've made, things that other people have said about you. And so as I think about that, um, I was looking at um, uh, Google and I was looking at um, social media and I was looking at the different satirical websites. And so you've got a lot to do now as a leader because there's a lot of information that's just coming from you, for, coming for you. If you ever saw the Matrix, there was you know Neo bends over and there's all these bullets coming. That's how um, information pretty much is. And you've got to be able to tell what's real and what is not real. And the um, satirical websites have gotten extremely sophisticated um, with posting things. And if you just Google satirical websites. I've seen friends and I always call them on it and they're probably very, very sick of me. But when they post things and you find something that's just so inflammatory or something that really upsets you or you think is just so shocking, that should be your first clue to be very, very suspicious of what it is you're reading. Because a lot of these websites, how many of y'all by show of hands are familiar with emotional intelligence or have at least heard the term emotional intelligence? Okay. So one aspect of emotional intelligence is remaining um, calm enough and keeping your equanimity to be able to be rational. Because if you're leading, again, you have people's desires and wills in your hand and you need to be very accurate about um, what you're doing. And so you have to keep your calm 
because the emotional intelligence literature shows us that when people get very, very upset, have any of y'all ever been so upset that you couldn't think straight? I remember, for example, when my mom passed away, I was trying to call my grandmother to tell her, and I was 33, year old, 33 years old when this happened, and I'd known my grandmother's telephone number by heart since I was like five years old. I couldn't remember her phone number. I couldn't figure out how to dial it. And so what emotional intelligence tells us is that is called an amygdala hijack. And that's this reptilian part of our brains that shoots out the crazy juice that makes us either fight, flight, or freeze. And when you're in that state of high emotional arousal, regardless of the emotion, you simply cannot think logically. And as a leader who is leading organizations and leading people, and people are sacrificing to follow your vision that you a lot of times can't even see, you have a moral obligation to be accurate. And so this, this misinformation issue and in information literacy is very, very um, key. So what I was saying, a lot of times my friends will post things, some of them on social media, and I'll instantly go through kind of a little process in my head. And when I find out that it's false, I IM them and say, okay, that's not true. That's from a satirical website. And so if you Google satirical websites, you'll see everything from the onion to um, the daily mash, Beaverton, News Thump, National Report, Waterford Rissler's, Hustler, Satire Wire, Reductress, the Babylon B, the, it's just on and on and on. And so if you look at the websites, they will actually say that they are satirical. So I came up with a little um, process. I'm looking at my stopwatch because I can't stand when people blither past their times and I'm at six minutes. And so um, I came up with a little acronym to just say, put on the stops. So when any, anything you read really excites you or really hijacks you or it's something extremely sensational, I put stops. So that's the acronym. So the S stands for skeptic. Always be a skeptic of anything you read that is extremely incendiary, that hijacks you a little bit. Be, be skeptical of it. So the S, the first S then stops is for skeptical. The T is for triangulation. Anything that is actually true and accurate, you're going to be able to look at reputable news sites to be able to find the same information. So for example, I looked at the news when it said that I um, got a news alert or somebody said, oh my goodness, Kobe Bryant passed away. There are always rumors of people passing away. So what I did, I went to the news sites. I went to Associated Press. I went to the network, CNN, MSNBC, ABC, you know, the Fox News, the different news sites. I went to um, the Lakers page. So you always want to triangulate. If you can't find evidence of it in a known um, reputable source, it's likely not true. So be a skeptic, triangulate. The O is to observe the author's intent. Rarely will legitimate journalism be trying to either upset you or to inflame an issue or to excite you because sound journalism, it'll give you the flavor of the story, but it will actually tell you the facts of what happened. So good journalism reads with a reads kind of like a police report that has some context in it. So look at what the author's intent is. So if the author is intending to inflame you, it's probably some misinformation. So skeptic, triangulate, observe the author's intent. The P, pursue outlets that have an opposite view because the truth is the truth is the truth. Even if it's something with an opposite, you're still gonna verify the facts. So don't just read from outlets that agree with what you think about. Take the time to look at what other outlets are saying <clears throat> about a particular issue. And then the last S on stops is Snopes. Snopes.com is an excellent way to look up different stories that you've heard because they just sit there and fact check things. So I would say, if you're looking at um, being a leader <coughs> and being a good leader, the only reason people follow you is because they trust you. And they can't trust you if what you're giving them, 
you're not going the extra mile to try to make sure it's true. So as leaders, um, it's our obligation to make sure we do not put false information out there. And if you do accidentally put false information out there, let people know immediately. Because if you are leading, it's really not about your ego. It's about trying to get everybody together to achieve um, a vision. And so that's kind of my um, take on misinformation. And that's how um, I approach it. And I think I'm pretty close to 10 minutes. I'm at nine minutes and 43 seconds. Thank you very much. What was the P again? I have the S, the T, so the any O. Any questions, comments? Well, let me know what was the P so again. So the was S there. was be a skeptic. Right. And T is the triangulate. The P was to pursue outlets that have opposite views, pursue the opposite view. So pursue an alternative perception. Because if you can find an alternative, let's say, for example, you only listen to Fox News and that's all you ever listen to. You want to make sure that if you can see that they're covering this topic, go look at another valid news outlet that has the opposite view and start to pursue the different perspectives because that's where you're gonna find the truth is somewhere in the middle of those. Don't ever just listen to news that agrees with your political mindset or because yeah. it's really, really unhealthy. That's when you start to be in an echo chamber. Yeah, we have um, Professor uh, Dr. Simmons, Aaron Simmons over at Furman is a philosopher and he is awesome at, at sharing one time with all of us that he has his own political views but he listens to all of the shows on the radio that are of the other yeah. views so that he can learn right. what the other side yeah. is thinking and he can learn how they're mm -hmm. thinking. And I thought that was quite interesting. Like to put that much effort into it is a yeah. lot of work, you know? But I, I appreciate that he because said- Because you're not gonna just be leading people that share your view. Right, Yeah. right. You're not just gonna be leading people who share your view. And you've got to influence people as you lead. And so you need to understand what people are thinking, understand why they're thinking, and just practice stretching your mind. If there's anything that I could say is always look at improving your critical thinking because not enough people are thinking today. Absolutely not. Uh, Dr. Linbo, um, we'd like to go ahead and hear from you if you can. And then at the end of you're speaking, we can go ahead and have some, if anybody has questions and answers, you can type it into the chat and I can read it to either of our speakers tonight. Just so you know. All right, so you go Would ahead. Would you let me, uh, share my screen, Christina? Yes, I can. Okay, there you go. Thanks. Everybody see that? Yes. Wonderful. So I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about uh, some of the work we've done here at Clemson in studying disinformation and the spread of misinformation and what we've learned uh, and hopefully how it might help you shape the way you use social media and engage on social media. So a lot of our work here at Clemson has focused specifically on state-sponsored disinformation. Um, we've looked especially closely at the work of the Internet Research Agency. That's the group out of uh, St. Petersburg, Russia, made famous by the Mueller report. Um, the building in the upper left there, that kind of squat uh, Soviet era building is in St. Petersburg. That was the headquarters of the Internet Research Agency uh, from 2013 through um, mid 2016, uh, or actually till just after the 2016 election. This glass building uh, is several blocks away from that little squat building. Um, they've since moved out of that squat building and into the glass building. It's in a nicer part of town, just across the street from a Volvo dealership. I looked it up on Google Maps. Uh, and uh, it is bigger and it has room to expand uh, because they've needed it. Because of their perceived success after the 2016 election, they got a lot more resources and resources come with people. Um, and we've learned a little bit about how they've applied some of those researches. So in 2016, uh, after 2016, Twitter was kind enough to release a number of handles of Twitter accounts that they attributed to the Internet Research Agency. These were handles that they said were meddling in real 
conversations here in the U.S., uh, especially political, politically motivated and cultural conversations. Um, and they didn't actually release the data for those tweets, not the, any of the actual content, just the names of the tweets. And, and the House Intelligence Committee released those names to the public. Unfortunately, here at Clemson, we have a tool uh, that allowed us to have sort of backdoor access to Twitter um, and allowed us to get access to suspended and deleted accounts. And we were able to download 3 million tweets from those 3,000 accounts and read Russian tweets until our eyes bled. It was the least fun I've ever had in my life. <laughs> but we learned a lot about how Russians operate, how they spread disinformation, learned a lot about their tactics and strategy. And over the ensuing years, we've applied that knowledge to actually identify ongoing work and attribute particular Twitter accounts uh, to the Internet Research Agency. Um, so here's a couple of quick examples from 2018 and 2019. And I chose these because they really show how well uh, the Russians are able to engage in very particular communities. That's their skill, is engaging in very particular communities in a fluid and organic way. Um, they, on the left, they do it in the Black Lives Matter community and the LGBTQ community. Um, more recently, they've had Latino-themed accounts. Um, and on the right, obviously, they do it uh, pretending to be part of MAGA America. Um, Plight Melanie there on the left, uh, one of my favorite all-time accounts. If, if you can get emotionally attached to a Russian account, I definitely got emotionally attached to Plight Melanie. She uh, was active just before the midterm elections in 2018. She accrued those 20,000 followers that you see there in, in just a matter of a few short months. She was building a, uh, a name for herself. She actually won the Chicago Tribune's Tweet of the Week contest in October of 2018 voted on by the uh, readers of the Chicago Tribune. She uh, had her quotes posted in C on CNN and the Washington Post. She, uh, if you've ever, if there's any parents with us this evening, uh, you may have read Scary Mommy Blog. She had a Scary Mommy Blog written about one of her tweets. Um, I mean, she was building a brand when we, when we gave her to Twitter and, and had her suspended. Um, Tyra Jackson there, uh, another Black Lives Matter themed account that was active in 2019. Um, this is what they do. They spread positive, uh, self-confirming messages like this, this real message about Warwick Dunn um, had 60,000 retweets and almost 300,000 likes. What I wouldn't give for a tweet to have 60,000 retweets. And I'm, I'm happy if I get two uh, but the Russians are good at what they do. They are professionals, marketing professionals. Um, and so they spread real heartwarming, positive messages like this message about work done. His own coach, Tony Dungy, retweeted that tweet from, from Tyra Jackson. Um, but they spread, they spread these heartwarming messages in order to gain credibility, gain followers, and uh, then obviously gain influence with those followers. Uh, this is a, just a selection of accounts that we suspended and that we worked with Twitter to suspend in March that we attributed to the Internet Research Agency. Um, it gives you an idea of the breadth of the types of communities that they engage with um, and how much influence they're able to accrue. Uh, David Lang there, Dixie Man Dave in the center uh, bottom, pretended to be a southern boy from Florida. Um, they like being from purple states. Um, Latino in Nevada, that Gonzalez there, uh, pretended to be a, a Latino America, American, or actually pretended to be a Latina American in Nevada, which is one reason we, you know, one of a myriad of ways you know that she's fake uh, because she called herself Latino in Nevada rather than Latina in Nevada. Uh, a quick tip for uh, some of these accounts, uh, one, one way you know that these are fake accounts is that several of these photos, Carrie Ash, David Lang, uh, Latino in Nevada, and Harmony Anderson aren't actual human photos. Those are what are called GAN images. Uh, they're computer generated images of, of human face. They, they combine um, dozens, if not hundreds of other real photos of humans uh, to create a, 
a computer generated image uh, of, of a human face. So those, those faces aren't real. Uh, they are computer generated and that's becoming a very common tactic uh, in disinformation. If you, if you, because you can't click on those, you can't do a reverse Google image search on those photos and, and come up with a, a real person somewhere because they're not a real person. Um, but, and, and these accounts were doing fundamentally the same thing the Russians have always done. Push extremes, push conversations in extreme directions, attack the middle, uh, and make us more and more divided and more entrenched in our beliefs. These accounts aren't trying to persuade Trump voters to become Biden voters or Biden voters to become Trump voters. They're trying to get people to entrench in their beliefs. Um, they weren't really trying to get any Biden voters. They were actually uh, trying to get people to support Bernie Sanders because he's the more extreme person on, on the left. Um, they're trying to get people to per be persuaded of something they were already inclined to believe, to go just a little more extreme than they might have gone otherwise, and to make other extreme voices more prominent. Uh, but the Russians, like I said, they've gotten more resources, so they've also gotten more creative. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but in March, we worked with CNN um, and, and uh, other authorities to shut down a, a Russian operation operating out of, out of uh, West Africa, out of Ghana and Nigeria. Um, because they have those resources, they don't have to just operate out of St. Petersburg anymore. Um, and it's also really important to point out that it's not just the Russians. Because of the perceived success of what the Russians did, whether or not you actually believe that they were successful in doing anything, I have my doubts myself, but there's a perception of success. And so uh, the Chinese are doing this. The, just in the past six months, Twitter and Facebook have shut down groups of accounts from Cuba, Iran, China, uh, Venezuela. The list goes on and on. There's over 60 countries that uh, researchers have identified are running disinformation operations of one size or another with, with fake social media accounts. Um, and it's not just political. Uh, as you see that headline in, in the center there, we've, we worked with this time last year, actually we worked with the Wall Street Journal to, to uncover a Chinese operation that was uh, targeting the NBA and Daryl Morey, the general manager of the Houston Rockets, who had the audacity to say something positive about uh, democracy in Hong Kong. But if I have learned anything in studying disinformation, it's that our biggest enemy isn't the Russians. It's not the Chinese. It's definitely not the Cubans. They're really bad at this. Uh, it's ourselves. And as I've studied disinformation over the past few years, and as I've gone to some very dark corners of the internet, uh, I've seen it get worse and worse. Um, this is data from Pew showing how the median Democrat and the median Republican ideologically has moved farther and farther apart in the past 20 years. And that trend uh, continues. And you see it on social media that these extreme positions are becoming more mainstream on both the left and the right. Um, it, you know, the other side could not be more despicable and our own side uh, could not be more of a hero. And that's not realistic. It's not how the world works and it's not gonna move our country forward. So that's why I think conversations like this are so very important. That's why I think edu education on these issues is, is really, really important um, because we've gotta learn to engage with each other. Um, we've gotta learn how to better engage on social media. We can't you know, surrender this responsibility to the platforms. Certainly there's not, they're not gonna solve the problem for us. Um, I mean, you know, I, I would love for the platforms to be, to operate better, um, but even if they do, just, I, you know, I tell my students, you know, I, I want my car to have a, a functional seat belt and, and I want my roads to be safe and well-maintained, uh, but I'm still gonna be a safe driver when I, when I, when I get my car out of the garage. Um, we have to take personal responsibility for some of these issues. And that takes a lot of education. Otherwise, it's just going to be more of this for the foreseeable future. And the country is not going to move forward.
And with that, I'd love to hear some questions. Very interesting. Um, I was almost going to start writing down my own questions. Uh, go ahead. I know I a threw a lot at you. Very fast. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a little shocked that those images are not really pictures of people. But I'm going to let Dawn go ahead and ask her question. Um, Dawn, I know you had your hand raised and I hit Dawn, unmute. I was, I was clapping for Darren. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dawn. <laughs> OK. Um, questions. Anybody have a question? Uh, here, we have Eden was asking, what advice do you have for concerned parents? Is this from? For you know, you didn't, is that for, you know, I'm going to say there's only, um, you can go ahead and ask that question. I don't know. Do you want to ask that to both of them or, or to what, any one speaker in particular? I'm fine if either or both answer. Okay. I just, um, you know, I, I tried to watch the social dilemma with my 17 year old son. He wasn't interested. Um, it's easier to talk to my to my kids who don't have the technology at their fingertips yet, but um, my older teenagers think it's no big deal. They don't, they don't see any problem with social media or what they're consuming. So, so um, apart from not giving them any social media at all. Um, Which is an option. <laughs> It is an option. It's a very difficult, my 16 year old daughter um, thinks that we're the worst parents in the world because she doesn't have a cell phone. But um, um, what do you do? I mean, is, is besides just having a conversation or limiting, I mean, are there other resources? Any other ideas? Go ahead. I think one thing I would say is to have them see you modeling getting to the bottom of some of this misinformation because I've been very transparent with my daughter and when I see things that are just your gut kind of tells you like this isn't really real I have her help me to search for things and now she's pretty good with triangulating things so I kind of share with her some of the things that duped me and how I looked at them to find kind of the accuracy because I'm a firm believer, I have a 32 year old and I have a 16 year old. And so it's a lot of time parenting. And while my initial gut was to try to shelter my kids from things, you know, I've now realized that my best contribution for me particularly to them is to help them show how to wade through things because I can't, there's no way to shelter them because there's so much going on right now in schools. It's beyond what most of us could have considered when we think back to junior high and high school, they're dealing with stuff that we didn't deal with until college. So that's just my point to take them on your investigative things or, oh, wow, I made a mistake and show them how you kind of dug the way out. I think that's fantastic advice. Um, I, I, you know, I hope to put off, you know, my own children being on social media, at, at least until they've started to develop some of their own opinions about issues, um, so that they're not going to social media as a blank slate. Um, I think it's incredibly important to have hard conversations with your kids about about some of these issues about you know, the very things that people are talking about on social media all the time. Um, it, you know, and if I can t take a minute to uh, pitch my own tool, we built a website uh, to try to educate on some of these issues. It's not terribly kid friendly uh, in that, you know, in the same way that the internet isn't kid friendly, but spottheTroll.org um, is a website we built to help people better understand how at least uh, the professional actors operate on, on social media. It's a quiz that you can walk through. Okay. I hope I, I it's just spot the troll.org. It's yep. all spelled out that way. Right. I put it in the notes. Um, Winston raised your hand. 
Uh, yes, thank you. Um, um, Darren, my question is for you. Um, you, you had the slide up that, that um, identified the growing gulf between the median Democrat and the median Republican. And um, one of the things that I've heard it said is that Trump didn't create the wave, he's just surfing on it. And it, it kind of suggested by your, the, the graphic that you put up. Um, so what, it can all be blamed on social media. And uh, especially given the fact that this, these trends started a, a, a while ago. So how, what other factors are impacting this um, growing divide that we're seeing in, in the country? Oh yeah, I mean, the, it, goes, it goes way back. I mean, I, I think you really see its roots in uh, political radio um, and, and the rise of political radio personalities. Um, a lot of the same personalities that you see as social media influencers today um, and YouTube influencers are the same types of people that were radio influencers a few years ago. And, and in fact, you know, some of those same radio influencers just moved to YouTube and found great success there as well. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's actually, I've actually read research that suggests we aren't more divided than we've ever been, that we are actually returning to a, a sort of tribalism that is not unnatural um, because, I mean, you know, we, we had a civil war 150 years ago um, where, you know, d conflict is, is not unknown to our country. Um, and uh, I've read research that suggests it's actually the Cold War just brought us briefly more closely together ideologically than, than is our natural state. And, and the Cold War just also happened to coincide when, with when we started tracking these things. Um, and so our start point is inappropriately high. Um, so that's not very hopeful, I realize. That's probably the, the least hopeful thing I could say this evening, that we're all doomed. Um, but, uh, um, but no, I think the roots of, of the growing divide uh, go way back. And it's not all social media's fault, though social media has, has certainly uh, contributed to it. But I think social, if I can say one hopeful thing, I think social media gives the perception that it is broader than it is in reality. I mean, you know, those, those photos that I, I sent you or that I showed on the last, on the last slide, you know, those aren't what really most Americans believe. And even the growing divide that the Pew data shows you discounts the fact that fewer Americans actually even identify with a party. So one reason that the parties are farther apart is because only the more extreme Americans have even stuck with the parties. Um, you know, more Americans identify as moderate than, than they used to. So uh, if I could say anything that would be hopeful, it would be that social media is a mirage to an extent, and uh, it highlights the worst parts of, of humanity rather, oftentimes rather than, rather than the best, at least when it comes to politics. Oh, yeah. I was looking um, at the question. Oh, is that the one you're looking at? Yeah, I was going to say, um, yeah, Otiana, um, you know, I was just going to back, back up and just comment, uh, especially in Dr. Lindell's comment is I used, my first job was, was one of my first jobs was working in the mall doing surveys, doing those market research surveys. So I was that person that stood out in the middle of the mall and flagged you down and said, hey, can you give me your opinion? And I learned working for two years for a market research company that all those surveys show 98% of people, those are not real. <laughs> a lot of those are made up because, you know, these companies pay you to do these surveys and they pay you for your filled packets that you get. And if you can't find everybody, you know, there's all these little you have to fill in a, a certain race, a certain a certain gender, a certain age, and a certain. If you can't find anybody or get anybody willing to do it, the companies are just going to go sit there and fill it out because they want to get paid, you know. And I was like, "Wow, this is really not accurate." So I never follow any of those anymore. Um, Otiana posted in here. Um, she said, "Have you noticed the impact of other platforms outside of social media?" That have impacted young people's perception of the world and themselves, kind of like what Winston was saying. And what groups are those that 
are the most targeted for misinformation. And so I think Dr. Smith, did you have a, a, a comment already forming for that? Right, that's what I was um, responding to. And I think you're absolutely right. You cannot blame social media for everything. Social media, ideally, I think in a parental relationship should be the start of a conversation um, about things. But also I think that a lot of platforms are impacting how people see each other and see themselves. I think um, reality TV plays a huge part of it because reality TV is not reality, it's scripted. And I think that advertising, when you look at advertising and what we're told that we need or told that we're lacking on um, the media as far as they cover and how they cover. I was doing a presentation earlier today on demystifying Black Lives Matter because people are arguing about it and they're talking about it in so many different ways and so many different aspects. And I was looking for a picture that would show a the real kind of heart of what that movement was. And I had to go to Al Jazeera Unfortunately, Al Jazeera has been taken off of US TV, but that's one of the most honest media stations that shows all these different views of things. And so I think that our news tends to just loop and loop and loop these particular images and images of each other that um, would, if it bleeds, it leads. I think that video games impact how we see each other and how we think of each other. The beauty industry, Lord knows, influences so much of how we see each other and the music industry of what we glorify and what is sung about and what is rapped about and the things the stars are saying. And um, I think that when you look at all these industries together, social media or not, they're all tying into getting you to constantly be wanting and striving and never having enough. And that insatiable desire to be or do or have something is the root of our capitalistic system. And so you keep wanting more and you're never satisfied. And so buy this product, buy this record, look at this thing. And so I think there are a lot of platforms besides social media that are impacted. Um, I'm gonna pick up a, a book real quick. Um, we had an event, this similar event Tuesday night and we had a, I don't have it right here. We had a speaker for that event as well. Um, and I talked to him on the phone last week and he said, you need to get this book for your, for your girls because I have a 13 year old and 17 year old. So I did and it came in the mail today. I just want to grab it and show you guys because um, he said it was a really good book. Um, let me just grab it for a second. If I could say one thing about this, this question about who's targeted, this is something we talked about in our breakout room regarding target targeting of fake news and misinformation. Uh, you know, there's, so often when we have these conversations, it's about what do we need to teach kids? Uh, but really the education needs to happen in retirement homes. Uh, the, the, the biggest targets of fake news and, and a lot of misinformation are, are baby boomers uh, and older Americans. Uh, they spread fake news according to some recent research and science on both Twitter and Facebook at, at rates seven or eight times higher than my students do. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're often, focusing our efforts in, in the wrong place. And I, and I think this is in some too often one of those one of those places. Yes, I think that's I think true that's well. so true, um, Dr. Limbo, because when you look at the generational research and the generational differences, those were the generations that trusted what the doctor said, mm -hmm. they trusted what was on the news. If someone calls on the telephone and tells them who they think they are, they believed it. And so the skepticism just started going from the traditionalists to the baby boomers to Gen X. And it, the skepticism sort of goes up as the decades go down. And, and so they're not digital true. natives. They don't, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a more confusing space oftentimes. And that's why they're, they're not just targeted by fake news. They're also targeted by scams more often, by phishing emails and that sort of thing as well. Yeah. Um, so the book that he said was, it's called Can't Buy My Love. And it, ha oh, I forgot you can't see this whole thing. <laughs> it's how advertising changes the way we think and feel. And it's by Gene Kilborn. And um, he said, it's, it's very good. I'll, I'll type it in here. Um, and so it has to do with how advertising affects us and how, how it's designed to affect us. And I think I also learned that when I, worked for a market research, market research and company that they were looking to make sure 
how did the message come across? Did they did you understand that they want you to buy this? Did they understand that you have a need um, for this? You know, and so that that really helped me, I think probably as a 17, 18 year old. Um, how advertising changes the way we think and feel. And so I told the girls, all right, we all need to start reading this. Um, oh, did that in the wrong place. So I just wanna share that. And just, I think maybe for everybody to know and understand, um, and then we'll, I'll wrap it up here. Um, Dr. Jean Kilborn, or, um, in your slides that you were sharing, there's a lot of it has to do with China and Russia and Cuba or whatever, also coming in and trolling in, it looks, seems like in the US, there, is that right? Like, is there a reason why the U.S. is consistently a target for this? Well, I it's remember. not just the U.S. I mean, I, I obviously. It, I, is it uh, everywhere else? <laughs> it is everywhere else. Yeah, no, the Russians attack pretty much any NATO country. Um, and, uh, you know, there's four profit operations that run disinformation campaigns in all of Africa. We're getting ready to start a research project looking at the spread of disinformation in Africa and Latin America. Um, I mean, and, and frankly, most disinformation countries target their own people uh, before other countries. Most Chinese disinformation targets the Chinese. Most Russian disinformation targets Russians because, um, you know, it's ultimately about about control or one way or another. Yeah, because I was going to say, what's the gain? The gain would be what control over the way people think. Yeah. Right. To sway society a certain direction. Exactly. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay, well, thank you all. We are going on almost, some of us, sitting here for two hours. So I know that a lot of us are tired and we're done and we are ready to probably either study or get to bed. Um, so I'm gonna thank you all very much for being here tonight and we appreciate you sticking with us for this entire time and um, opening up your minds to some dialogue and to some learning of some different views. Um, we encourage you to stay in touch with other things that we do on our mailing list. Um, January is Interfaith Harmony Month, and that's where we're gonna start um, seeing different faiths and different um, what they do. Um, and most of it's gonna be virtual as well. So um, we just wanna encourage you to kind of keep your ears open and your mind open to learning about different faiths and different cultures. And even people from different colleges we got to all associate with tonight, so. Thank you all for being with us. And thank you, Dr. Linville and Dr. Goosby Smith. We appreciate it. Um, and we are going to go ahead and end for the night. I think that would be good. You can go ahead and unmute yourself and say bye. And thank you if you like. Um, bye, bye everybody. Everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah, right. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Stay safe and healthy. Yes. Yes. All right. Have a good evening. Take care, y'all. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Bye. appreciate it. Thank you, Scott, appreciate you being on. <laughs>